Recall in the past we've said that an instruction set architecture is the combination of the physical hardware of the machine and the set of instructions that we use to manipulate that machine. Uh, this is, as far as the physical hardware, when we, when we talk about that, we're saying uh, we're talking about the number of registers, the methods of addressing memory, um, and that instruction set design. Now, these are the components that make up the actual architecture. We've talked in the past about architecture versus organization, but I want to point out here uh, that things like the number of execution units, how we build a pipeline, how much cash there is, that's all decisions we make that have to do with the organization. Now, why are these things separate? How do we draw that line? The answer lies in how we define the instruction set architecture. Remember that we said the instruction set is there because we need it to control the physical hardware. So if we want to have a way to have our ALU add and subtract and do modulus and perhaps do a bit shifts and things like that, we need the physical hardware to allow it to do all these actions, and we need the instructions that then carry out those, impl those implemented actions on that hardware. That is what makes up the architecture. Now, if we want to become strategic about making that process faster, we can deal with that in the organization. So there's one or a couple of broad topics I want to talk about on the architecture side now before we more broadly go into the organization side, which is where most of uh, the future videos in this area lie. But the, the two topics I want to explore here are the, um, the, the nature of the instruction set. Is it, what, is it what's referred to as a complex versus a reduced um, instruction set architecture? and why we might use one over the other. And I also want to talk about uh, the nature of the instruction, if it's a fixed or a variable length. These two decisions are architectural decisions. Things like pipelines, multiple execution units, they are all organizational uh, decisions. Let's start with uh, discussing CISC and RISC. Before we do that, let's look at a list of current architectures that are out there in the wild right now. This is not inclusive um, of everything, it's just a subset of some major ones. So the first one on the list here is, is the IBM mainframe series. This has obviously uh, been around for a long time, um, and it has evolved uh, quite a bit over its lifespan. Uh, what's neat about this is that most of what this architecture had initially is still supported uh, in the current versions, even though we've had decades of evolution. Uh, another one that is very similar in nature is Intel. So there's a very good chance that the current desktop machine you're using is powered by an x86 uh, powered chip. Uh, currently, we're in 64-bit versions of that, so it would be x86-64. Um, but, you know, the 32-bit versions were prevalent for a long, long time. IBM Power or PowerPC, this one's been kicking for a long time, and it's still in use. Um, Watson is a good example, actually, of a machine that runs on IBM Power. Um, but they run uh, server lines off of this, or called the P-Series. But another interesting place that IBM Power has been used um, throughout the years is uh, in the past it's been used in PlayStation consoles. And in fact, um, more than a decade ago, Macintoshes actually were powered by uh, what were Power PC processors. Sometimes they're referred to as cell processors as well. Uh, ARM architecture is very, very common today. Uh, it's the most prevalent architecture, actually. It's powering most, if not all, of your mobile devices. So mobile phones, including iOS and Android, and also, you know, any kind of tablets, um, like iPads or Android tablets, that kind of thing. Uh, the last example here is um, the Oracle Spark uh, platform. This is a server platform that was used by Spark. This one has actually been decommissioned by Oracle themselves, so this will not be evolving in the future. So I've, I've gone ahead and kind of removed it just by noting that it existed in the past, but crossing it out. 
Architectures that aren't on this list, I haven't discussed much of Amtel or uh, any of the other uh, MIPS versions or anything that, that might be in the embedded world so much, although you will find sometimes ARM architectures used in embedded devices. Uh, I've, stepped, I've stuck to basically mobile devices and higher here. So what are some of the challenges we have uh, in designing these architectures, and especially how have these architectures evolved over the years? If we go back and look at this list, uh, Intel and the mainframe in particular have been around for a long time, many, many decades. Um, some, like ARM, are newer on the block. Um, so it, it merits discussion of, you know, what have we learned, what's changed over that time? Well, the answer is not too much. Um, there's a couple of variables that we're going to talk about, CISC versus RISC, and fixed length uh, versus variable length instructions, but overall we haven't changed uh, too drastically from the initial design. Uh, this is why an architecture course uh, can be taught today very similar to how it was taught decades ago. Um, that's very rare in computer science. So what we want to do first is just kind of talk about uh, the evolution here. So uh, some of the earliest platforms here, the IBM mainframe and the Intel uh, family, they are what was known as a CISC-based processor. So a CISC-based processor is a compl uh, complex instruction set computer. Uh, what that means is that uh, there's more instructions than you would find in the alternative, which is a reduced instruction set computer. So that seems a little counterintuitive, right? Why would early computers be complex instruction set and later computers be reduced instruction set computers? Well, the reason why is because in the early days, and, and still today, but it was much more prevalent of a problem in the past, the most expensive uh, component and the most sought after component to the programmer uh, using a computer was memory. Uh, you know, specifically main memory or RAM. This was a very expensive and limited commodity. And because of that, anything that we could do that would uh, reduce the amount of memory needed that a program could use to run would be advantageous. To put it in a, in a very kind of brisk explanation for now that we'll dive deeper into later, because a complex instruction set allows more things to be accomplished with one instruction, you actually can create smaller programs. Let me give you a very quick example, one that we're going to come back to. Um, and this isn't, you know, maybe an absolute, uh, you know, that, that risk doesn't have something similar to what I'm going to do here in CISC, but it's meant more as a conceptual exercise. So let's, per let's do a, a multiply instruction. A multiply instruction, let's say we have a basic CPU that to do a multiplication would be doing multiple additions using an ALU like we've constructed in the past. So a complex instruction set computer might offer just a multiply command in this kind of imagined scenario. And the multiply command uh, instruction would then carry out however many additions it needed to to complete um, what was required by the program. A reduced instruction set computer might have the programmer actually um, put in each add instruction. So let's say that you wanted to multiply you know, 5 times 5. Well, instead of having one line of code in the, the CISC instruction in our imagined metaphorical example here, the reduced instruction set computer would have 5. Uh, one for each edition. So this means that you would actually have many, many more lines of code possibly on the risk side. Now, how did this really manifest? Uh, it wasn't really always uh, so simple as this kind of metaphor. Um, more often, it's that complex instruction set computers will have references to memory addresses uh, for both loading and storing in an instruction. So for example, say you wanted to add two numbers, and unlike little man computer, you actually have multiple registers and accumulators and things like that in which to do it. You might say to take the value of two memory addresses 
and add them together and store them in a third memory address. Well, that sounds pretty straightforward, but use what we know about how this, this situation works. First, we have to actually go get from memory both of the things that we want to add together. And then we have to actually do the addition, and then we have to save the result. So at minimum, there's two loads here, an addition, and a write back or a store. And this is all wrapped up into one instruction. A reduced instruction set computer would never um, have more than one action take place per instruction, or at least that's the philosophy. If it's completely adhered to in a strict sense, um, that, that's kind of hard to determine and, and maybe not accurate, but that is the philosophy. So in this CISC example, I could have one command that carried out both those loads, the addition, and the write back, but in the risk uh, world, I would have to perform each separately. So I would have load, load, add, write back, and those would be four different instructions. So I think you can see how the size of the program on a RISC machine can actually get much larger than it is on a CISC machine. So for this reason, early machines, like the mainframe in Intel, they sacrificed complexity in the hardware to actually achieve a smaller program that they could run in memory. Because remember, as we're talking about uh, what's required to make this work, if I have one instruction that carries out those two uh, loads, the addition and the write back, that means that my control unit has to actually be able to carry out this entire operation. Remember, there's no black magic here. Every instruction that we have in memory corresponds to some decoded, as we put it through a multiplexer, um, amount of switches that we're effectively turning on and off uh, to put the hardware in a certain configuration so that as uh, the clock cycle goes off, uh, information will be uh, routed to the particular place we want it to achieve the result that we do. And if our instruction is complex in nature, we have to have a much more complex piece of hardware in order to carry that out. Every instruction we add, and in a CISC architecture, there will be many more, will bring with it hardware that it needs to accomplish the task. In a risk-based situation, I would have each of those components just be a discrete small piece. So you're really just dealing with a smaller set of discrete actions and then like Legos putting them together. So I would just be doing an individual load, another individual load, then an add, and then a write, right? So I have four discrete individual situations that to be honest, the complex instruction set computer is gonna have those as well. But then on top of it, it has all these more complex combinations of those things that we might carry out. Um, and we have to have the hardware to support that. So that's why we refer to it as a complex instruction set computer. But remember, along with that complex instruction set becomes much more complex hardware. So you actually have a harder to build machine, but it uses less memory. Uh, and for that reason, it was much more popular, uh, especially in the early days. Now, as we evolved a little bit past that, somewhere into the, the 1970s and 80s, uh, a lot of research started going into, well, what would happen if we remove some of this complexity and we worked on a reduced instruction set? And the amount of complexity into the CPU would go down, the cost to, to manufacture would go down, the power consumption would go down, a lot of factors would be um, affected by this decision. So the, the result is that, to be honest, um, risk is inherently generally faster than CISC. It depends on what you're running through it, and it depends on, um, what I mean by that is the workload, it depends on the type of work you're running through it, uh, what the program actually does. Different programs will uh, come up with different results um, based upon the two architectures. But um, this is actually no longer true. So it started that way where, okay, risk is faster now all of a sudden, but then something happened uh, to mitigate that, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, basically, the CISC crowd 
uh, came up with a, a cool solution uh, to fix most of that speed gap. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So uh, historically, we've actually gone from a more CISC-based world to a more RISC-based world. If we look at the current architectures that we have today, um, you know, the CISC ones are still with us, right? We still have the mainframe and we still have Intel. Um, but it is true that most newer architectures that have been developed have been developed in a RISC nature. Okay, so I mentioned that there was a way that CISC can close the gap on the performance difference between CISC and RISC. Now the way that's done with is something called microcode. Now this is very interesting. It's actually a very first layer of abstraction that we can use on top of the hardware to effectively abstract a CISC machine so it can be become in effect a, a RISC machine. Now let's back up a little bit. Why would we even want to do that? Well Let's remember that at this point, as things are evolving through the 80s and into the 90s, it's becoming more clear that risk is going to be faster. The efficiencies of running things uh, in a smaller uh, package and not making it over complex is winning out in the long run. And because memory is becoming more available, the fact that the programs are larger on a risk machine is becoming less of a deterrent to actually using it, um, and, and that's starting to kind of pan out. Now, what happens here is that for a architecture like x86 to kind of continue, it has a contract to uphold, which remember is that instruction set. All programs work on x86 because that instruction set has remained consistent. But uh, developers at Intel are having trouble making the, the uh, Intel platform go as fast as some of the risk-based competitors. So the answer was to change the Intel platform to actually work, and not just Intel does this, by the way, IBM does it with uh, the System Z as well. But the answer was to change over the underlying architecture to be more risk-like so that they actually design the hardware uh, to implement instructions in a very risk-like fashion, but to layer on top an abstraction called microcode. And what microcode did is support the original CISC-based um, instruction set so that any instructions you wrote would compile to the original CISC contract as defined by the instruction set that Intel has been using throughout the generations. And then what the abstraction does is take that CISC instruction and basically decode it into separate RISC instructions, which is what actually run through the CPU. Now they also get to pick and choose when they want to do that. They can still have the complexity in the CPU when they want and just have the CISC instruction go straight through, or they can use microcode to basically um, decode the CISC based instruction into RISC instructions uh, to run individually. Um, this now is, remember, something that is inherently going to be kind of flashed onto uh, some kind of memory that is basically read only on the board. It is possible to change microcode. In fact, IBM does this on System Z quite often, uh, but it's not something that you would do. Uh, every day. And on most x86 machines, it is probably never done at all. So how do we compare and contrast the difference between CISC and RISC? Well, one way we can do it is by measuring things in what are known as flops, which is a floating point operation per second. Um, another way to do it is something called MIPS. You might hear this term thrown around it as well. This is just millions of instructions per second. Uh, generally speaking, the floating point is considered a better comparison uh, because it's a more complex operation. Uh, simpler operations tend to unfairly, in a sense, favor risk, and it doesn't give you uh, as much of an apples to apples comparison. Um, that said, risk still has a small edge over CISC, but the microcode gap has really closed much of that performance. You can run, you know, test A and test B, and Intel might perform very well on test A, and ARM might perform very well on test B, 
but it's mostly because they're different workloads. Now there is one big difference uh, that we have not discussed that comes into play uh, with RISC and CISC and where RISC still shines, and that's actually power consumption. So we're going to get more into that in the next topic.